Good morning. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here. And I'm very grateful to Start Strong for giving me the opportunity of coming to Ireland again, one of my favourite places. What I'm going to do is a quick canter through the report that's in your booklet. How can the government ensure that early care and education is of high quality in a market system, learning from international experience? All the details of what I have to say are in the report, so if you want to check any of the references or if you want to follow anything up, you should be able to do it from the report. I'm just giving you an overview now. I should say this business about Professor Emerite basically means I'm supposed to be retired. <laughs> So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the current context of early childhood education and care, which is commonly referred to as ECEC, um, and the current context internationally, I mean. I'm going to talk about quality at a macro level and at an international government level, and I'm going to talk about quality at a micro level. What are the issues on the ground for those working in and receiving services? And then I'm going to focus on the childcare market. What is it? Is it a better and quicker way of delivering services? Or is it just a default position that nobody's really thought about? I'm going to look at five examples of countries with childcare markets. I haven't got time to go into them in detail, but they are in your booklet. And these countries are Norway, New Zealand, the Netherlands, Australia, and England. I'm going to talk about how Ireland compares with other countries who have childcare markets. And I'm going to make some recommendations for improving quality based on this international evidence. I wouldn't dare come here and suggest uh, what Ireland should do. I'm merely concluding from the international evidence. So, what are the issues? Well, the issues are, how can quality be assured in a situation where there are many different kinds of providers operating different services and where provision is changing rapidly? What risks does a market model entail and what kind of policy options are open to governments who follow this route? And from an economic point of view, is it worth spending taxpayers' money on ECEC? Do the returns, better educated children, more women in the workforce, justify the expenditure? And this is one of the conundrums um, that all governments faced about balancing out cost efficiency and quality. So how do you reconcile the two? Well, the current context Internationally, wherever you look, there are more women with young children working and there's an unmet demand for childcare places. Also, there's a debate going on about early education, formal, uh, more formal education than is offered in a preschool or um, a childminder setting. And there is evidence uh, there, there's an economic debate, certainly, about early education improving the life chances of vulnerable children. There's also internationally more importance given to children's rights issues and on their day-to-day -day experiences when they go to any, any kind of setting, that should say. And UNICEF in particular has been pushing that agenda. So governments throughout the world have been expanding their ECEC provision, either directly through state provision or indirectly through encouraging the private market. And most recently, the EU has set targets. Childcare places should be provided for 33% of children under three, 90% of children three and over, and 95% participation for children aged four and over. And most European countries are working towards these targets. Some of them, um, quite a few of them, have already achieved these targets. So they're not fantastic targets. They're definitely achievable and on uh, 
countries' agendas. Because of new demands and expectations for services, along with increasing access, most countries have been developing their policies and services in the last 10 to 20 years. And there's a lot of work internationally on monitoring the changes that are occurring, both in the OECD, the, um, which is the, sometimes called the Club of Rich Nations, which looks at how developed countries, uh, including America, Australia, the Far East, how they manage their services, as well as um, European countries. So the OECD produces something which makes very interesting reading called the Family Database. And that lists comparisons, including how much countries spend. It's a very, very useful document to have a look at, and it's updated regularly. Similarly, the EU, EU statistical service Eurostat has been monitoring all the changes in Europe. And it issues these regular Eurostat reports, which also are very detailed and make very interesting reading. The U UNICEF, the, the Innocenti Research Centre, the research arm of um, UNICEF, has also been documenting ECEC in rich countries to highlight the needs of the most marginalised children and to focus on children's rights issues. So there are three major sources for looking at international comparisons. The purpose of making these international comparisons is to enable individual countries to check their progress against external measures and to gain extra insights for options about developing policy. Um, I come from a country where there's incredible hostility to the EU, unfortunately, and people are very dismissive of the OECD and the EU. But in fact, uh, they do offer us very, very useful guidelines and routes towards sorting out uh, issues in early childhood and on a number of other family issues. So the two central issues um, for comparison by all these international bodies are on access, how many children can get to the service, and on quality. Well, there are three ways of looking at access. The, uh, should I use the word advanced? Yes. The most advanced countries, in inverted commas, argue for equitable access for all children irrespective of family income or location, on the basis that all children deserve and have equal right to services. Well, that's a perfectly reasonable argument for education. Nobody would dispute it. But it is more problematic when it's applied to early childhood. There are countries who've definitely achieved that and who have enshrined in the law children's right to education or to early education and care. And my favourite anecdote, um, which some of you may have heard before, is about being in the wilds of Corsica, in the most remote, remote mountain village and a, uh, at Christmas. And a lorry driver comes in with his very small daughter. And the bar owner says, does she go to... Uh, does she go to Ecole Maternelle, does she go to preschool yet? And the, the lorry driver shrugged and he said, well, of course she does, she's three. So if you can provide universal coverage in really remote areas, um, then, then you're, doing, you're doing well. So some countries have had for a long time the goal of providing equitable access for all children. In fact, in France and Belgium, They've had that goal for something like 100 years. So it's quite some contrast with what happens in England and Ireland. But there's another way of looking at provision. That is, you provide targeted provision or privileged access for the most vulnerable children on the basis that such children are least likely to access services but to be most in need of them. But targeting although it's supposed to be cheaper, brings its own problems. And there's a famous um, phrase 
A service for the poor is a poor service. Um, and targeting is not simple, and it doesn't really, it creates almost as many problems as it solves, although I'm not going to go into that now. A third line, which is really um, the line of these lacy fair economies like Ireland <coughs> and uh, England, access is just left up to parents to sort out, so they can buy what they need when they need it, on the basis that it's not the state's responsibility to make such decisions. So three ways of looking at access. And what governments have to decide is what are the cost implications of these approaches to access? We'll move on to quality. The comparative literature focuses on what policies governments have to have in place to ensure access and quality. And at a governmental level, of course, there's no universal prescription for access or quality. It just depends on expectations, goals, activities of those who provide and use the service. And at one extreme, there have been countries where there's been a long tradition of universal state-funded services with well-educated staff and good conditions of employment. And the public expects that. It's not controversial at all. And at the other extreme, especially in the USA, there's a great reluctance to spend taxpayers' money on any kind of public service. So quality is very much linked to wider government policies. Well, at a macro level, at the level of the government, quality for example, in the OECD documentation, is defined as having low child staff ratios, pre-primary or nursery education, i.e. not preschool, for two years or more before school, well-trained staff with continued professional development and good working conditions, and adequate public funded funding, whether services are state provided or not in order to enable access for all children independently of parents' ability to pay. So the OECD <coughs> measures countries according to whether the, they can fulfil um, those kind of criteria. And PISA, which is the International Comparison of Education Statistics, which some of you may be familiar with, PISA, an analysis of the PISA statistics say the countries which achieve the highest educational levels are also the countries which manage to operationalise these aspects of quality in the early years. And the EU also is working on issues of quality. And it, similarly, it defines quality as providing equal access for all children, making sure the political, legal and financial structures are in place to deliver it, clear goals, coordination, monitoring funding, and critically, a well-educated, well-remunerated staff and a common curriculum. But we tend not to think of quality at this overarching level. We tend to think of quality as what happens in the setting. How do, how do the children feel? How do the parents feel? How do the staff feel about what goes on on an everyday basis in a childcare setting? And there's lots and lots and lots of studies of this, but they come mainly from the field of child development and they draw on psychological measurements and outcomes. And this work on quality within the setting doesn't really cross-refer to any of the work about quality on a macro level or on the role of government. It focuses on what happens at a nursery or a preschool level and on how teachers and childcare staff can work with children on a day-to-day -day basis to improve their learning. That's the kind of quality that so many people think about when they think about quality and not at a higher level. But the two are very, very closely related. So the literature on quality identifies two main variables, structural variables, that is staff training ratios, premises, etc., and process variables, the quality of the interactions between staff and children. 
And there are lots of attempts to measure quality at this micro level and to develop ratings and kite marks based on these measures. So in England, we have the Ofsted inspections. Um, there's Some of you may be familiar with ECHAS, which is the um, American system for, for judging quality. There are all sorts of kite mark schemes. Some of the big um, private companies have their own kite marking schemes and so on. And these quality measures vary across the research studies. And the results from investigating quality at this kind of day-to-day um, -day level, invariably the results depend on the context in which the study was carried out. But in general, the consensus is, and it's very obvious when you think about it, Poor quality provision harms children's future prospects, but high quality provision offers some kind of protective and social educational boost, especially for vulnerable children. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides, um, the elephant in the room. I use this to describe the private sector. It seems to me that all this debate about quality, about access and so on, is somehow carried on as if the private sector was like any other form of provision. And it doesn't require any extra attention-focused <coughs> research. Private childcare is like the elephant in the room. Most of the work up to now that's been done about ECEC ignores the differences between the private sector, the voluntary sector, the state sector. But in fact, I want to argue that these differences are crucial. Well, what do I mean by the private market? It's a whole lot of things bunched together. It's big companies. It's small entrepreneurs operating out of their own home. A fantastic range. It's a very mixed picture. But the bottom line is that the nursery must earn enough money to cover all its expenses. Making enough money is the first priority. It has to be, otherwise you go out of business and you can't survive. It's the first priority over and above the child's or the parent's needs. That's not to say, of course, that private providers aren't concerned about children and parents, but making the books balance is crucially important. Now, these next two slides, don't bother about the small print at all. Look at the orange. The orange... Uh, these are reproduced in your book too. The orange indicates all the countries where there is a large private market. And there's plenty of them. Oh, we seem to have been there before. Right. I, ah, well, this is what happens when you construct your... PowerPoints late at night. <laughs> I just wanted to give you some <coughs> illustrations of the issues involved in paying for childcare. And this is a um, quote from a parent and the kind of um, way she has to think about what she can afford. So she doesn't, first of all, think about, I want to find the best place for my child. She thinks, how can I afford it? How can I fit it in with my working hours? How do I know that it's any good? Now, can I go backwards with this? Because I had such a lovely quote about, well, we'll go on. This is the book that my colleague Ava Lloyd and I wrote about childcare markets, where we've been accumulating the evidence, tough evidence, about how the childcare market really operates. 
And in order to understand the childcare market, you have to think about what a market means. Traditional economists regard the marketplace as a metaphor for all financial transactions between people. So people who supply goods and services can set up their stalls and people who want or need those goods and services can choose which ones best meet their needs. That's how markets operate. And in theory, supply and demand balance themselves out. So if there's demand, the supply increases very rapidly. And if there's falling demand, the supply of services shrinks. The market is very flexible, which is why governments like it. Also, economists argue that competition between providers keeps prices down. Competition between providers drives quality up. And consumers make rational, informed choices between the options available to them. These are the assumptions behind the private market. So let's just test them out in the field of childcare. It's true, the supply of childcare does increase very quickly if there's demand, much more quickly than if the state were to plan and develop services. Entrepreneurs can set up childcare very quickly, negotiate the finance and the premises and set up shop. But, in general, entrepreneurs want as high a return as possible for their investment and choose to invest in richer areas where higher fees can be charged. And the finding from more or less every country, Brazil, England, the Netherlands, wherever you look, the finding is the private market childcare is always skewed towards richer areas. And as a general rule of thumb, the best childcare is for the parents who can pay most. So fine, childcare increases in a private market, but it doesn't guarantee equal access by any means. <coughs> and I just want you to have a look at these two examples. Here's a, a nursery chain. It's got a posh new premises, uh, a bit barren, but, you know, adequate room, adequately planned, and so on. It's from a very well-known company, and all their new premises look just like this. This is the lower end of the market, a small terraced house with no outside space and children crammed into quite small quarters. And you can guess what sort of area, which kind of provision is located in. But also, if you are supplying or selling a service, you have to market it. You have to present it in such a way that people will get to hear of it and like what they see. Generally, the marketing for childcare uses brand names, which draw, you know, that you, you, want, to know, you want to know that this nursery is here, you want it to give it a definite identity, and they, the childcare settings use brand names which draw on a tradition which presents children as cute and cuddly rather than from a children's rights perspective as persons in their own right with feelings and perceptions which deserve respect. Here's some of the names. Double Ducks, Little Bears Club. In fact, they're extraordinary names when you look at it. Heaven Sent, Little Cherubs, Reach for the Stars, Kitty Winks, Little Monsters, Jelly Beans, Looby Loo, and so on. This is, if you look down the list of any uh, childcare facilities, these are the kinds of names that crop up. This is how childcare is branded in the private market. And this was put through my door. Here's a bit of competitiveness for you. I don't know whether it was actually effective, but I, I was very surprised when I got the leaflet, I must say. 
So, the theory is that competition drives down prices. But does it? Parents have to pay for childcare in the absence of a subsidy system, and childcare is labour intensive and therefore costly. Prices cannot be cut if staff are paid properly. And having well educated and well remunerated staff is a key aspect of quality. So the childcare market in that respect is atypical. Competition doesn't drive down prices unless you exclude the notice that I just showed you at the bottom end of the market. But the theory also is that competition raises quality. <coughs> in fact, the evidence from economists in the USA is that competition lowers quality. Price is so important that cus consumers stroke parents will go for the cheaper options, which tend to be the poor quality options. Competition doesn't raise quality. And in any case, there's a whole debate for parents about what quality is. But also, competition means that the market's never stable. Entrepreneurs go in and out of business as their business thrives or fails. So volatility is very high in the private childcare sector. Big and successful firms expand and take over other businesses, and small, unsuccessful businesses shut down. And these changes go on the whole time, not like the education system where the provision's guaranteed from one year to the next. There's, a there's quite a high turnover in the private market. And of course, when there's any kind of change, staff and parents don't usually have a say in these changes. It happens over their heads. Now, just have a look at this. This is a Dutch firm which this year has gone out of business. The firm was called Estro, and it ran 360 centres in the Netherlands. And this is from the business news about who's going to take over this nursery chain, what's going to happen to the least viable nurseries in the chain. Uh, a lot of them are just going to be shut down. And a lot of jobs will just go. The company was declared bankrupt on the morning of Saturday, 5th of July. And the company had to... Uh, apply for court protection to guarantee the, the um, investors' profits. So this is a completely different kind of affair from the sort of way we, we generally think about early education and care as a service. It's actually big business, and it involves large sums of money at the one end of the market. The other theory, the other economic theory about how the childcare ma market works is that parents are rational consumers. They make very careful decisions about what, what childcare setting to choose for their children. But in fact, they can't do it. Parents of young children are tied by circumstances, where they live, how they travel, what other children they have, how sympathetic their employers are. Parents are not free to choose. And having found a place, parents very rarely choose it or swap products because the cost of changing it, changing a nursery, is too great for the mother and for the child. So even if the mother has a, chosen a bad place, it's incredibly difficult to change it. And in most countries where there's a childcare market, Mothers from low-income households work less than mothers from high-income households. It's just too difficult for them to overcome the problems of negotiating the market. And tax credits makes the situation a whole lot worse because they are um, retrospective, but parents have to pay the money up front. And the whole business about making claims is really difficult. I mean, never mind who's entitled to them. Making a claim is a difficult process. And in England, where we have a tax credit system, something like one fifth of all parents don't claim. It's just don't claim the tax credits to which they're notionally entitled. Well, I suppose that's a way of government saving money, isn't it? Right. Now, most of the information that I've been giving you 
comes from the experience of other countries. As you saw from the orange lines on the OECD chart, there are quite a lot of countries where there is a substantial private sector. And in this report, I looked at five of these countries, Norway, New Zealand, Netherlands, Australia, and the UK. And they all showed similar problems about the application of market theory to the childcare sector. But only in Norway were the services of high quality and guaranteed equal access for all families. Why was that? Because there was very generous funding for the private sector to enable them to meet the 15% of household <coughs> income ceiling for fees, but it was tied in with very strong regulation. Control over entry to and exit from the market. You couldn't just set up a nursery. You had to do it uh, on a local basis, looking what else was there. Uh, the fees were pegged. There was strong curricular guidance, and there was parental, parental and local control over business plans and over the curriculum of the nursery's childcare setting. So the only country where the private market worked was the country where the state was also very interventionist and provided the funding. Otherwise, the same old problems about unequal access and variable quality uh, applied. Now, how does Ireland compare on these international perspectives? Well, I'm sure you know the answer. It performs very poorly, if not actually at the bottom, on most international comparisons, on comparisons of funding, quality, access, and so on. The recommended OECD EU level is around about 1% of GDP. Ireland, the, the financial statistics are a bit wobbly, but it's around about 0.2% or less. There are good guidelines, but there's weak enforcement. But what's most striking, apart from the lack of funding, is the lack of coordinated policy at a macro level. Ireland hasn't got the pieces in place to deliver a good service on a comparative basis. So the conclusion about Ireland is that it's taken significant steps to bring it into line with international standards, but it falls considerably short of those standards. And it hasn't yet recognized the particular problems of quality and access posed by a mixed market model. And on the basis, oh dear, look at international, sorry, the red line didn't show up when I was doing the. On the basis of international comparisons, um, I've made these suggestions. If Ireland wants to go up the comparative table, it just has to do these things. Clarify and develop national goals and objectives. It's all in the, the report with elaboration. It needs to have a national, a cohesive, coherent, integrated national policy, not a bit here and a bit there and a bit there that doesn't add up. It needs badly to upskill the ECEC workforce and pay them. It un needs to underpin all these developments with adequate financial resources. It needs to strengthen regulation very considerably. It needs to increase local accountability. And it needs to know that it's doing these things. So it has to improve monitoring and regulation systems. One of the difficulties I found when I was doing this uh, study was just how weak a lot of the um, Irish data was in comparison with what's available elsewhere. So uh, quick skate through, roughly on time. So thank you very much for listening. All the details of what I've been saying are in the report. If you have any queries, uh, please do email me. Okay, thank you.